Hi everyone, David Lewis here. I'm a fourth year medical student and one of the program directors of the IGL program. Um, this lecture is going to be a basic science lecture on neurology, which can be a very daunting topic. I'm only going to talk about this very superficially to give you a basic understanding of how the um, central nervous system and peripheral nervous system uh, works. Some of the learning objectives, and again I'm going to talk about the organization of the nervous system. I'm going to briefly go over um, the cerebral cortex and their functions. I'm going to talk about basic neuronal tracts, some cranial nerves, um, how the brain is perfused by uh, the circle of Willis, the meninges, and uh, a few brain bleeds known as epidurals and subdural hematomas. So the nervous system is organized into two main, main components, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So to start with the central nervous system, it's pretty simple. It's broken down into the brain and the spinal cord. It's all one continuous um, item, obviously, but we're going to kind of think of them as two separate things, the brain and then the spinal cord, and we'll stop at that. The peripheral nervous system, on the other hand, is broken down into um, something known as the autonomic nervous system, um, which, which is comprised of the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetics, this... Um, this diagram is great, but it fails to show that there's a third section known as the enteric nervous system, which is um, a vast nervous system in the gut, which is um, uh, very complicated but controls um, digestion. And the other part of the peripheral nervous system is the somatic nervous system, which is um, what we know as voluntary control of our muscles. And you can see how, uh, going back over to the central nervous system, you can see how um, some of the, the origins of the brain lead to things like the pons, the cerebellum, and the medulla. So again, here's the central nervous system. You can see the brain and the spinal cord. You can see what's known as the brain stem, which is um, kind of the connector um, of the brain to the spinal cord, and it uh, is comprised of the midbrain, the pons and the medulla, and the hindbrain um, does not include the midbrain, but it includes the pons, the medulla, and the cerebellum. As far as the cerebral cortex goes, we all know that there's two hemispheres of the brain. Um, internally, they are separated by the corpus callosum. And uh, this is a good picture of the different lobes, the frontal lobe, parietal, occipital, and temporal. And you can um, take a second to look at each of these lobes and um, their function. So the frontal lobe is important for things like personality, the parietal lobe is important for speech and taste, the temporal lobe is important for smell and hearing, and occipital is important for vision. There are also two very important areas known as the motor cortex and the somatosensory cortex. Damage to either of these will produce different type types of um, motor or sensory findings if there um, is either damage to the brain or um, uh, a, a stroke. So the homunculus is a representation of the amount of innervation to the brain, whether it be the somatosensory cortex or the motor cortex. They both show the same thing, though. And what they show is that there are different parts of the body that are more uh, highly innervated, whether it be through sensation or for tactile motor control. Um, but they're both pretty similar in that the face is very highly innervated as well as the hands. So the autonomic nervous system is import for, important for control of smooth muscle cardiac muscle, and various glands like salivary glands and lacrimal glands, important for um, tearing of the eyes. Parasympathetics are known as rest and digest, and um, sometimes you'll also hear them referred to as cranial sacral, and that's because if you look on the right where the blue is highlighted on the spinal cord, you can see that the cranial area of the spinal cord and um, brainstem as well as the um, sacral area of the spinal cord are involved. And you can see on the left that sympathetics are involved in the thoracolumbar regions, meaning 
um, the thorax T1 through T12, and the lumbar regions L1 through L5. And the difference between these two um, are whether or not they're involved with um, things like digestion, resting, um, or fighting or and, and flighting, meaning um, do you need to use your skeletal muscles or do you need to use your digestive system? So if you need, and here's um, kind of some of the different functions of these organs, and you can figure out which ones are involved uh, as far as parasympathetics or sympathetics go. So if your heart rate needs to increase and the heart needs to contract more, would you, would you think that's parasympathetics or sympathetics? Um, similarly, do you think that if you need more blood flow to the gut, do you think that's going to be more parasympathetic or sympathetic? So you can go through each one of the organs in the body and figure out how innervation by the autonomic nervous system will control these organs. Here's a good picture that shows the differences between the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but I would like to bring your attention to the right side of the picture, which shows that the sympathetic nervous system releases norepinephrine either onto a target like smooth muscle or cardiac muscle or glands, or it targets the um, adrenal gland, specifically the middle of the adrenal gland known as the adrenal medulla, which secretes catecholamines like epinephrine and norepinephrine. On the other hand, the parasympathetic nervous system releases acetylcholine onto cholinergic receptors like muscarinic receptors and nicotinic receptors. The nicotinic receptors are found on all of the ganglia for both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, as well as on skeletal muscle, which is the somatic nervous system. Otherwise, uh, as far as uh, acetylcholine goes, in the autonomic nervous system, it will bind to muscarinic receptors. Some of the adrenergic receptors include alpha-beta receptors like alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2, muscarinic, um, which there are multiple uh, muscarinic receptors, and nicotinic receptors. Somatic motor receptors uh, are nicotinic, the adrenal medulla we talked about, 80% of the catecholamines released are epinephrine. And the sweat glands are a little unique in that they're sympathetically controlled, but instead of uh, norepinephrine um, activating them, they are controlled by acetylcholine. Here are the receptors. I'm not going to go through this table, but I put it in here in case you wanted to review the different receptors and the G proteins that are involved. Okay, so let's actually talk about the nervous system and how it functions now. So we know that there's a certain flow of information. If it's sensory, then there are sensory neurons that um, go um, back towards the central nervous system, and then there's some type of response, whether that be a reflex or more of a voluntary control. Um, or if it's just pure motor, then there's no real sensory input. The person might think about moving their hand and, and they are then able to, to do that. But um, if we look on the right, you can see a basic um, reflex arc that takes place. Um, and this involves you know, a stimulus hitting, the, in this case, the patellar tendon. Uh, a muscle spindle recognizes that there's stretch in the quadricep muscle. The afferent neuron, uh, which are the neurons that are involved with sensation. Afferent means um, two. So in this case, two, meaning that the, the flow of information is going to the central nervous system. And then alpha motor neurons are automatically activated. In this case, the alpha motor neurons going to the quadriceps, which are the extensor muscles of the thigh. On the other hand, you can see this interneuron, um, which is an inhibitory neuron, which prevents the flexor muscles um, in the thigh being the uh, hamstring, so those are inhibited, so extension of the leg occurs. I want to quickly show you what a cross-section of the spinal cord looks like. I want to bring your attention to um, the arrow pointing to the gray matter. Um, the arrow, even though it's showing gray matter, I want to also say that this area on both the left and right is known as the dorsal horn. And if you move down, you can see what's known as the ventral horn. Um, so what happens is you have sensory information going 
through um, the blue neurons, which are the sensory neurons. The cell bodies are all contained in what's known as the dorsal root ganglia, and the information travels all the way through the dorsal root ganglia, the, vent, the dorsal root, and into the dorsal horn, and um, efferent with an E, those neurons uh, go from the, the front side of the spinal cord, known as the ventral side, and those go through the ventral root and um, out to their targets. These are the three main pathways uh, or tracks in the central nervous system. Uh, on the left you see position and proprioception. The middle tract is for pain and temperature and the motor pathway is the picture on the right. And I'm not going to go into these different tracks but the point is to show you that they all cross over at some point whether it's in uh, in this case uh, the medulla or in the spinal cord for the spinothalamic tract which is involved with pain and temperature. But the point of this is that if you have damage to the um, cerebral cortex from a stroke then the reason that the patient patient symptoms will be on the opposite side is because that even though the damage is on the same side there is a crossover. So because of that crossover the the lack of innervation to muscle or um, any types of type of sensation is going to be on the opposite side. So also if, if it's not a stroke and say someone's spinal cord is damaged then if the tract has already crossed over then it's going to be the same side. So that's something else to think about. Also um, I will show you that on the picture on the left you can see where the thalamus is um, being highlighted on both of those pictures. So the thalamus is the relay area for all of um, sensation and on the right you can see the internal capsule is being highlighted and that's the pathway that all or most of the motor pathways uh, travel. <coughs> so if the thalamus is completely destroyed then all sensation will be gone. It's a pure sensory stroke and if the internal capsule is damaged then it would be a pure motor stroke on the, the entire side of the body. Here are the different cranial nerves. There's 12. I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, take a look. They're important to know about um, when performing a neurological exam on someone with a stroke, um, knowing how they, um, they function and where they're located are important to um, targeting exactly where the, the stroke may have occurred. I also want to talk about circulation to the brain. Um, this is known as the circle of Willis and it's broken down into three main components or at least that's how I think of it. You have the anterior cerebral artery, the middle cerebral arteries, and the posterior cerebral arteries. Um, and instead of focusing on this which shows a lot of uh, the vasculature, I'll show you this picture. On the left you can see where the, the anterior, middle, and posterior circulations um, perfuse the brain and you can see again on the right now the homunculus. So for example the homunculus shows the leg hanging into the middle um, of the brain between the, the two different hemispheres. So if the ACA is involved which highlights kind of that central portion the leg and the lower body is involved. Now as you move to the to the side of the homunculus where the face and the arms are that's more going to be the middle, middle cerebral arteries. Um, so those are the two main areas that you're going to look for as far as stroke goes with weakness in the hands and the feet. If the, if the person has trouble moving or lifting their right or left leg then you, then you want to think about an ACA stroke. Similarly if they can't feel their right or their left leg you want to think about an ACA stroke. And um, if the hands or the face are involved like you see a facial droop then you want to think about more a middle cerebral um, circulation problem. The meninges are um, three layers that cover the brain. They are underneath the skull but above the brain. Um, so there are three different layers. There's the dura matter, arachnoid matter, and the pia matter. The dura matter is just beneath the skull and the pia matter covers the brain um, tissue very tightly like saran wrap. It goes down into um, each one of the 
um, sulci, which are these infolds of the brain. Um, the leptomeninges is just a combination of the arachnoid and the pia matter. And between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter is the subarachnoid space. And this is um, where the, the CSF, or cerebral spinal fluid, um, hangs out. Meningitis, therefore, would be inflammation of these meninges secondary to an infectious cause. And common findings uh, of meningitis are fever and nuchal rigidity. Nuchal rigidity means that um, when you put your chin to your chest, that will stretch the meninges, and if they're inflamed, it's going to cause the patient to experience even more pain. And encephalitis uh, is similar to meningitis, but it's inflammation now of the brain parenchyma, not the meninges. So in this case, because the brain's involved, um, common symptoms include confusion or some type of altered mental status. You can have both of these um, going on at the same time, and this would be known as meningoencephalitis. Lastly, I want to talk about two different hematomas, epidural and subdural hematomas. Um, a hematoma is a collection of blood. In this case, when a, a vessel is bleeding into part of the, the brain space on the left, you can see what um, an epidural hematoma looks like. And the reason it has this kind of biconvex lens-like shape is because the dura matter is still in place except for where the bleeding is taking place. So the blood is trapped in a certain area. And an epidural hematoma is caused by a ruptured middle meningeal artery, which is kind of a branch of the external carotid artery. Um, and on the right, you can see the uh, what a subdural hematoma looks like. In this case, it's not confined by the dura matter, so the blood moves freely, and it looks more like um, um, more like a crescent shape. And bleeding um, into this area is caused um, by bridging veins. One other thing I'll mention about an epidural hematoma is that there's something known as a lucent period. So if a patient experiences head trauma, maybe they lose consciousness for a second, then they wake up and say that they're fine. That may go on for a minute, five minutes, ten minutes, and then all of a sudden they lose consciousness. This is known as a lucid period. And subdural hematomas are common in, in the elderly, uh, maybe after a fall. They're slow, they're chronic. Remember, this is a, a venous bleed. It's not uh, an arterial bleed, so the bleeding is slower. So the patient may experience symptoms um, less severe initially, but, but in the end, they kind of add up to, to um, change the person's mental status. So here are two CT images of the head. Um, on the left, you can see that it looks more like, um, more like a, a crescent shape, and on the right, you can see it looks more like a biconvex lens. Therefore, on the left would be a subdural hematoma because it's not confined by the dura. And on the right, you can see what's an epidural hematoma. And this, again, this biconvexity is because the dura is still attached at the two endpoints. So the bleeding is only taking place there. So that's a really fast recap of how the nervous system is organized and uh, as far as both um, uh, with the, the nervous system and the arterial supply to the brain. Hopefully this was helpful. The cases will do a better job of um, giving some different presentations of how patients might present with a stroke or a hematoma. And the next lecture by Elise um, will kind of give you more of the clinical scenarios as well. So thanks.